guys, how's it going? Um, Craig here from Bass Lessons Melbourne. Um, another player profile video for you, and this time it's with Francis Hilton from Incognito. So, Hi there. thanks, man, for taking the time. I really Pleasure appreciate it. Pleasure to meet you as well. So, you're up here for the Caloundra Festival, which is happening right there. Yeah, right next to my ear. Right next to your ear. How's it been going <laughs> for you guys? Uh, we've had a great time here. Um, the setting is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Not quite as gorgeous today because we've got a bit of rain, but it, it really does help to kind of lift the spirits. We travelled all the way around the world. This is a six-week tour, and it's uh, the first couple of shows we did after coming from Melbourne. And uh, we're just really relaxed and chilled out. And uh, one of the other reasons why we're in such a good mood is because Tower Power are here, as you know. And uh, we used to bump into them quite a lot every few months on the road. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, that hasn't happened for seven or eight years. So it's great to see all the guys. Yeah. There's a couple of new faces, but most of the guys have been there. Yeah, they've got a new singer, I think. Yeah, Marcus, he's, he's fantastic a, he's as well. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he's got big night. shoes to fill. I think it was Larry before him. Yeah, it's always know, big so. shoes no matter what, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool, man. So obviously, you're the bass player, and you know, um, how did you come to play bass? What was your, your journey? Um, have, well, play bass guitar, play anything? Yeah, no, so. play, play bass guitar, yeah. Um, it was almost an accident, uh, so my background in music was just from being a music lover from a small child and um, my sister who's a year older than me, she's a classically trained pianist, she started playing piano when she was three and she had quite a strict teacher so uh, she had to play formally and not look at her hands and look at the paper and sure. she's become this amazing sight reader and she still plays now. Um, Whereas I could just get on the piano and mess around and teach myself little theme tunes and yeah. songs from the radio. And that built my interest. I uh, started collecting records from like mid-teens. I was really getting into hip-hop music and I loved all the breaks that they were sampling uh, and DJing with in the 80s. Um, were you DJing? Uh, I, was, I would say bedroom DJ. I was a bedroom DJ okay. yeah. in my mind. I didn't own decks for, for, uh, until the 90s. but. Yeah. But uh, I used to be really into like the, the, the mixing and scratching competitions and all those things. But what, what was really getting uh, drawing my attention was the music which was being played. I mean, um, not a lot of people, the audience for hip hop is much bigger than it was then. Yeah. Uh, but I was hearing all these amazing funk records. I mean, things which now people are more familiar with. But back in, the, in those days, these records cost a lot because they were rare. Right. And I had a lot of early Kool and the Gang records. I had. Um, that I had literally just for the drums. I, re I really liked the music, but the drums were really what were drawing me. I wasn't thinking about bass or anything like that. Yeah. And that came when I was in college in Manchester, I'm studying there, and I was surrounded by musicians. And that's why I mean, it was kind of an accident. I but you, but uh, you weren't studying music? I was studying engineering. Yeah, right. So it was the only way I knew I could possibly get into a recording studio as a producer oh, slash yeah, engineer. Audio yeah. engineering, not mechanical yeah. engineering. But the place I applied for, Salford, was, uh, oh, yeah. had a music department. Yeah, that had the first quite, quite ever. a well-known music department in Salford, I think. Yeah, and it was, I was there from 90 to 92, and there were some excellent musicians who passed through there, yeah. many of whom I, I bump into, some I, I work with, I'm in, still in contact with, and they were a great inspiration. Um, uh, and somebody, somebody on my course at the end of the first year was selling a bass guitar for £10. And uh, some people were really saying, get yourself an instrument, you know, you, you like to pick up instruments and mess around, why don't you buy this? So I bought this bass for £10. And I just went and played to all these records that I've been buying since the 80s. You know, I had this big collection of funk right. and, and I just played along until those rec until I sounded like the record, you know, and um, which I'm not quite sure how <laughs> true a statement I really was, but I did my best and kind of straight away because of all these musicians there started jamming. Yeah. After college and then concerts around Manchester and and what what kind of I mean was it mainly the kind of funk R and B soul stuff you were doing or mainly funk when I, whenever I got together with other musicians it was 95 percent funk and soul which I found harder because I wasn't really leaning towards soul I liked the grooves I was sure. as I said I was kind of more give me the drum beat and anything can happen you know yeah yeah um, but I also I, I love pop music too but I yeah. wasn't really in and uh, mostly seventies and early eighties pop music but like this. Uh, Funny enough, I actually did get to play with Gloria Gaynor, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, just a lot of pop music. I, I, I still, if when I'm in a tuition situation, I do kind of say to people, don't, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is have some sort of negative attitude towards the music, which is not your favourite type sure. of music. There's so much to, to, to get from uh, the music, which is not even your favourite. And sometimes I listen back to like recordings of gigs that we do, what have you, and I, I just go, I think I was kind of going into the mode of, I was thinking about this song, that lick reminds me of this Talking Heads thing, or you know, 
or, or, or from another band. Yeah, it happens yeah. all the time. I'm yeah. sure it happens to other people too. But I think you're, what you can bring to the table is what you are uh, uh, absorbing from elsewhere. I think it's yeah. really important. Yeah, open, keeping an open mind. Yeah. Yeah. So then from, so once you kind of got into the music scene now, was it, uh, did you go and study or just, just, you were just kind of gigging and working from there on out? No. Um, I mean, obviously I was at that music establishment, but uh, uh, there was a drummer that I lived with in uh, my first year. When he heard I was playing bass, he said, oh, I'm going to get you some, uh, you need to do some lessons. And I know just the guy, yeah. there's a guy called Graham, Graham Hughes, um, mate of mine from Sheffield, he's fantastic. And I've seen Graham play before as well. Great bass player, I haven't seen him for all those years. And uh, I had two lessons with him. But all we kind of do was, We'd sit there for a few hours. He'd play, and I'd get to see him play amazing in front of me. Yeah. Uh, he told me to keep one finger per fret, um, which I did religiously. In fact, I was walking around with like tape boxes in between my fingers, like that, watching TV. Really? Which is a really bad move, but it, <laughs> I luckily didn't injure myself. And uh, within like you know a few weeks, my span was big enough so that right down the bottom yeah. in frets, I could yeah. you know do that reli reliably. Um, I practiced a hell of a lot after that, so I just got like a lot of hand strength but I was doing everything by ear so one benefit was that I've got perfect pitch so and and a really good memory so I could remember mm. the licks from the track and remember which bar they happened and things like that and after a while of learning funk tunes uh, or any kind of pop music you realize from learning music that mostly songs are very very similar and that certain things happen in certain places and when they don't that actually helps you remember exactly, what's going yeah. on yeah the hardest thing was when like I played in a couple of country bands, and it's just like they're all the same, pretty much. Yeah. But just the thing that makes it different is oh, the bridge goes to the the six, and the bridge for that one goes to the flat seven, kind of stuff like those kind of things. Absolutely. Thinking of it like that. Oh, I, I can I can learn twenty songs that are completely different pretty easily. Yeah. But you know, fifteen songs or ten <coughs> songs that are very very similar, I find it hard to discern. You know, sure, I'm no yeah. good at remembering the name of the song until I've really really learned. <laughs> until it, it but... starts on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's the hard way, I think. It's important to use, to develop your ear, and obviously I was doing it that way around, so I don't really have a problem there. But I still had to take what I was hearing, and so at certain points I would get stuck. Yeah, know, um, know, know what it meant. Yeah, I mean, um, and, and sometimes it kind of creep up at me. I'd be playing something for a long time, and I thought I was playing it okay, and I just realized later on that if I went from, a, if it was a, a, in a major key, say, um, and all you're hearing, or let's say it's a minor key, for example, and uh, so you know that your minor pentatonic is going to work over that, and that's giving you a lot of room. And then you can throw in some chromatic things leading into certain notes. You know they're going to work because you've done it before. Um, let's say the four chord was, was a minor. Yep. I might have been playing everything up to that point in Dorian, which is going to give me a. Uh, a major, major six degree. If it's if the four chord is a minor, then that six degree related to so the root is now a minor. Yeah. And I didn't hear. I wouldn't necessarily have heard that to begin with. Just after a year or so, I was like, oh, you know what? That doesn't really. That's yeah. not really right. You okay. kind of got away with it, but it's not really right. So, if I'd been learning it from theory up, it kind of would have been pointed out or a bit more yeah. obvious. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think it's still it still ultimately comes down to this in yeah. the ear, you know, if, it's, if it sounds good, it is good. Yeah, but I mean, maybe that's showing that also your ear can fool you too. True. You know, if you, if you, if you don't really know what it is that you're doing and you get off on a lick, yeah. you know, some licks, they don't necessarily have to work uh, for, you know, strictly, you can play something with a minor in it over a major chord, sounds kind of funky, but if yeah. you did that for the whole song, yeah. every time a third came up, you played the minor, people would be looking around at you. So yeah. at some point you've got to, you know, you've got to take the rules and break, and then break the rules. Yeah, yeah. You know? like Breaking as, the rules and uh, then taking the rules is, I don't know. As to, as to if I would say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And too much knowledge is just a mundane thing, you know. P yeah. Possibly, possibly, I don't know. I'm not knocking it. I don't have too much knowledge by any means. <laughs> so can you can you read? Can you read dots, or is it just um, kind of charts and by well, your Read mainly? dots. I, I read charts. I, yeah. fi I find charts distracting. Um, sure. And you just try and commit it to memory as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. So in the last couple of years, I've been I've been pushing myself to read more, and also when I'm learning um, to read dots more. I've been able to read charts for years, but. <clears throat> But with the more dots there are, I'm just get it's like dyslexia or some sort of blindness. I'm looking at them. Yeah. All of a sudden, my ears stop working. So I'm yeah, like, well, that's yeah. not, don't, that's very bad. That's definitely worse. So, um, but 
now when I get a new song to learn in my head, I'm writing it down. Oh, just okay. as a practice, because in, 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 in reality, it's not, I'm not doing it. I'm not, you know, we, I don't get given sheet music by the band or sure. by Bluey. Oh, right. okay. um, and it's quicker. Sometimes we rehearse something and we've not really had the chance to listen to it. And it's easier. I can learn it in one or two listens and then we can run it and that's it. It's set. Oh. And uh, it, it helps that I've been in the band for a long time. It's 11 years now. So I know what it is that we're trying to do. It's not like a band. I've got to walk in and work out what's yeah, going on okay. okay. stylistically. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last time I was given music uh, on the spot, funny enough, was it Gloria Gaynor? No, it wasn't Gloria Gaynor. It was um, Kathy Sledge. Who I'd worked with before, Sister but Sledge? from Sister Sledge, yeah. So, um, in fact, we were on the same bill together. I was in, I was playing for all these artists in this, um, on this night in Dubai a couple of years ago, and uh, so it's a very long sound check. And I'd learned everything, I memorised it all, um, but I'd been given some charts and I'd looked through them, and everything was fine. So I had those in front of me. Yeah. Um, but we got to the end of one of the songs. I'm not sure what it was, and I was just like, huh? <laughs> I'm not reading what I'm hearing. <laughs> Uh, at all, I, I, I just put my hand up and say, like, "What are you doing? I don't, I've not heard this. I'm not reading it." I said, "Oh, you don't have the new chart." The guy came, the MD came up and had a look down. I said, "Oh, sorry," and ran off and gave me another chart. Bunch of dots. That's what it was. Uh, you know? uh, so, okay, so he still had to walk from here to there. <laughs> so I'm like, "Okay, I know how the song goes. There's something happening, and I just heard it. I just heard that I didn't know it. So let me just go through here." Let's just chunk it down. I'm not going to read all these dots, yeah. but I can, I can, you know, I can read the first beat there. I can read those accents there. It's going to be fine. And we went through it, and it was kind of okay. Yeah. Then I went read through it again. That's not sight reading, though. I mean, my sister is an awesome sight reader yeah. coming from the classical world. She can't play pop music as comfortably, but I put the most incredible music in front of her, and she'll just read it it's, it's, it's like an that. Incredible skill. Yeah. Potentially eight notes at once as well. With yeah, she'll she'll play like seventeen. You know, there's a bar, like a, a, a bar with seventeen notes there, and the left hand with rhythm. She'll read it like no problem at all. Yeah. For the first time. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I'll never reach that kind of level. Plus, no. I only mostly have to play one note at once. But I would like <laughs> for somebody to be able to give me some music and just comfortably, and it only be dots, and comfortably just read it. Okay. And I'd like to do that, even though it's never happened. So sure. I just think it's a skill that's worth having, and it's it's another way of of. Uh, uh, conceptualizing the music you're going to play, yeah. which can and it can be really, really helpful when you need to know which bar it is that we're <laughs> going to rehearse. You know, yeah. kind of say, oh yeah, you know, after the bridge bit, that second beat, and that's too complicated, really. To say bar 43, beat three. Yeah, especially yeah. especially in larger ensembles and stuff like that, where there's a lot of people. Yeah. Thrown off the yeah. yeah. Um, so you're kind of steeped in the old school funk records and stuff. Did you know who those players were at the time, or it was just, you know, this is a James Brown record, this is a P Funk record, or did not you have, always. was there any kind of bass players back then that really influenced you and your style? Well, not before I, well, before I started playing, no. I, I knew some of the names because I had the records, so I could, and, and I'd read the covers. Okay, yep. um, when I first started playing, um, one of the guys I was living with owned the bass guitar. In fact, just before I bought my bass, he let me borrow his for a few weeks, you know. Okay. Came back after the summer holiday and I was playing, you know. and. Um, he said to me, oh, are you going to be the next Jacob Pistorius? I said, who's he? You've not heard of him? <laughs> Come here. And he had a CD, just bought this Best of Weather Report collection. And um, I'd heard Birdland. I think that was the first tune. The second tune was Teen Town, if I remember rightly, on this compilation. So Birdland, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. This used to be the theme tune to some TV program yeah. in the UK. Um, and but I thought, oh, wow, that bass playing is pretty cool. I never really noticed that. And then Teen Town came on. I was pretty much like, hang on a second, stop, stop, wait, wait. stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? You know, I never heard bass playing like that. And I liked it. I really liked okay. it. It was funky without being funk. I don't know how Riverport do it. They, they yeah. have very few tune, uh, records which are really like funk records. Um, a couple of things on Sweet Nighter perhaps, but they just have this sound which has got groove and harmony in it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I that, mean, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that rhythm section. Of, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think the next tune after that was punk jazz, and I, and I was just like, hang on a second, no, there's a whole <laughs> world in here that I, you know, I was up in my Kuna gangs, up in my James Brown, but there's, wow, I didn't you know you could do, do that this. on the bass, yeah. 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 Um, so Jacob Astorius definitely stood out, and it made me really cocky when I first started playing bass because some of the licks I fell under my fingers quite easily, right. and I realised that you could put them in certain places. But when we started gigging, it's like, look, I can't really. I'm just finding that the songs all sound the same if I play like this, so I need a few other Tricks. reference points when I'm playing. And I had loads of them, but I didn't really know who they were. Uh, I always loved Chic. 
Um, St. Bernard Edwards um, was an influence there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so hard to, to cop that feel that Bernard has, that just behind the beat. It's yeah, thing. yeah, but it's so. I mean, but most of us grew up with it, even if we weren't properly checking it all the time. Yeah. You know, um, it's it, it's a really desirable sound to have. Absolutely, but to, yeah. to me, as I was saying before, that you know, my, my ear was firstly drawn towards drums more than anything else. So to me, the groove was always totally tied to the drums. If the drums was doing something else, the bass wouldn't necessarily work. Exactly, and, yeah. and also, while I was listening to records, it, being a, a hip hop bedroom mind DJ, um, mind DJ. You, you're hearing these records over and over again every time I hear Apache by say Incredible Bongo Bands or any of these funk records it's exactly the same you know exactly where things are also those old school DJs they got two copies of a record where the drums and everything's going like this in time you know you get to learn where that bit where it sat back a little bit felt really cool right and it becomes important and, and it's frustrating sometimes when you play a song one of these old records and and it's just everybody's playing it steamrolling ahead you know yeah. Um, uh, and not really thinking, this has got to feel right. This is what made it great in the first place. Okay. Yep. So as much as I was listening to bass players, I was really checking drummers too. The drummers were just as important to me yeah. um, because I found that the records that I was really loving had this amazing com uh, combination. So uh, definitely a name there, apart from everything that James Brown was doing. Yeah. Chuck Rainey. Chuck Rainey. You know, and Chuck Rainey was playing with a variety of different artists, different styles. Yeah. But he was always playing with a great drummer and he had this great harmonic sense and moved around in a really, really cool way. Mm. So I find, you know, he's probably like the, the biggest influence. Yeah. So I look around my record collection and he, he's the, the name that comes up the most, Nathan East, Marcus Miller, Marcus, you know, yeah. and, and they can also do incredible things. I mean, Marcus has, you know, has got his own style of playing that you can hear it when somebody's copying his style of playing. Yeah. Yet he's a, a, also, you know, a pop player. Yeah. First cool pop player yeah. and producer, solo artist in his own, own right who's accomplished so much. Yeah. Um, so he's just an inspiration because he's covered so many things in such a, a strong way. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. So do you, do you write as well? So you yeah. have a little kind of mobile set up here? You... Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have Incognito and then we have, um, a, at the moment we have a side project called Citrus Sun as well. Um, most people in the band have got their own albums uh, too, and we kind of appear here and there on, on other people's things. Sure. Um, for Incognito and Citrus Sun, I've written some material on my own and brought it to the band. Yeah. Um, we also get the rhythm section together. Pretty much every album will hook up a Bluey studio or somebody's studio and just jam something and record it. And from that, we'll, con we'll say, oh, this is a good idea. Let's try this now. And oh, then cool. some songs yeah. will come about from that. Um, I don't normally get involved with lyrics or, or melodies, although I imply them with, a, with, with the right hand on the piano. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for, most albums have got at least a couple of tracks on there. Um, and Citrus Sun, I think the, the, the last Citrus Sun album, I've got three songs that, that I wrote in my place and then brought me to, to be recorded by everybody else. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've kind of always done it, even when I first started playing with no like musical knowledge as it were, I've just been interested in that. You know, I wanted to be, like my, before playing a bass, I wanted to be a producer. Um, and to begin with as a pop producer, I, I was really into what Trevor Horn was doing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it, his name kept appearing on these records that I had, these pop records, and I yeah. thought, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I'll do. I'll be a producer, whatever that is. It's, he seems to be connected. I kind of got, the, got it right, what the producer does, I think. Um, and then when hip hop was getting big, I thought I'd be a hip hop producer to sample everything. You know, and then maybe I'll pick up a keyboard and just do left hand like I've, I've done for all these years. Um, but yeah, that part of me is it's something that I need to get out as well. I've just got all these ideas. And the great thing about being in this band, the Blues, really, he's, he's welcoming to ideas that we have. He, he's very patient. He'll give you space. He'll tell you what he thinks. It's always constructive criticism, even if he's not going to use something. Um, That's cool. And yeah. he'll let you stretch out. And he, you know, he knows it's a process which you've got to, to go through. And you know, you're going to grow from that process. Yeah. And do you write from the bass up, or it could be harmony Rarely. or melody? Rarely. Rarely. Yeah. Um, so I only did that. I think the only song on, with Incognito that I did it from the bass up, more or less, was a song called The Less You Know, which is on two, uh, Surreal. That's two albums ago, where <laughs> Bluey actually phoned me up. And I was taking some time off. I, ha I had some, some health issues, so I was not playing. Uh, but uh, he called me and said, look, you, uh, I need a track. <laughs> I need a track. 
and I want it to have like the most incredible bass line ever. And I want every student bass player to be like trying to learn this line and doing their own videos on YouTube. No and I want a million hits. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll do that tomorrow then, you know. <laughs> and uh, I did sit on it for a couple of weeks. I was like, I'm not quite sure how to go about this. And, uh, and then one day the penny just kind of dropped. I was on the way to studio and I was playing, uh, I was playing some tunes. We play each other a lot of music. Yeah. But we both feed each other songs. And, um, and I just played something to Bluey that he really liked. It's a really obscure record. And in fact, at the time it was, um, I was playing it, this track that was sampled on a hip hop record by a UK rapper called Jest. Um, and the, the sample that he used is from Robin Kenyatta. So this thing, it's Stanley Clark on bass. Right. It's, it's a really old record, nobody seems to talk about it anymore, but um, Blue was like, that's what I want. I want something that's like this. I thought, I can do this. I can do like, you know, because this is like hip hop. <laughs> to me, it's like, it's just, it's just, there's no uh, third in the tune. There's, there's root four and five, and it's ambiguous. Yeah. See, for me, I like to have the feeling of something. When I'm, when I'm going to write something, the inspiration, I, I listen to a bunch of stuff, but I want the energy from that stuff. Yeah. But I don't want any licks. I don't want any parts from yeah. that track. I don't want that. I, I just want to feel it. So, um, <clears throat> and I know when I've reached that point that I've got a, a feeling that I'm going to do something using an influence. Um, and when, that, when Bluey said, yeah, something like this, I just thought, I know what I'm going to do. And I just messed around. I was thinking, yeah, it's going to be 16s. It's going to be, it's just going to push and push and push. And from that, everything else kind of came. You know, I don't even remember writing the chorus, but I know it all happened in a day. And then I sent it to Blue and was like, what do you think of that? It's like, yeah, okay. Cool. And that was that. Other, apart from that, everything I do from the keyboards. Right. Because uh, I'm not a keyboard player um, as such. You know, I, can't, I, couldn't, I couldn't sit in for any of our keyboard players. Um, but I, I kind of taught myself over the years all my harmony by sitting at a piano. Yeah, yeah. I've always had a piano in the house because of my sister. Uh, so I'm very comfortable at sitting around and I can spend hours noodling and kind of working things out. So if I can do something on the piano that kind of sounds interesting to me, I'll then pick up the bass and do something. And usually the bass comes very quickly because yep. I'm kind of inspired by, my, by myself. But I find it difficult to just pick up a bass and come up with a line um, because it's, it can be arbitrary. Yeah, it can just be muscle memory kicking in. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, often that is what's happening. Muscle memory kicks in, and I just know exactly what everything is. That's just you playing that lick. That's not you playing a line. Something new, yeah. But if you give me something to play off, you know, in a jam situation or in a recording situation, um, it's much easier. It's yeah. like I like it or I don't. If I like it, yeah, something comes. I'm not even looking. I'm not really thinking. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, was, what would you say would be your kind of first big break in terms of gigs and, and playing? Uh, the first big break that I did with a band that was signed was Galliano, who oh, yeah. okay. uh, were big in the, well, their, their period from the very late 80s when they first formed uh, until 1997, I think was our last gig. Um, and I did the very last, um, well, actually, I did the last tour that they did, world tour. Um, they just finished recording their fourth and final studio album yep. um, but bass and drums didn't want to go live with them on that tour so um, so I came in with a new drummer and uh, it was a, it was a great experience I was 24 I think when I did right. it and uh, you know I was very young and hadn't really seen the world I'd been abroad before but this was like wow, wow going all over Europe on a tour bus for like six or seven weeks um, People turning up, I, I, I share, even to this day, I share similar hair to, to, the, to that bass player, a guy called Ernie McCone. Um, and uh, it's funny, we turn up to like a place in Austria or something like that, and somebody would be like, Ernie, Ernie, I'd look around and the, the face would go, oh, <laughs> it's not Ernie, you know, it's just girls and guys, right? Just, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not here, you know. Um, but it was, it was, it was great to, to see all these places, and I'd never considered it because I, you know, I was really more thinking that I was eventually going to be a studio cat anyway. Okay. It's never really, I've never really been, it's never worked that way. I've been live from day one of playing. It's been at least 80% live and, yeah. and not as many sessions. And I thought it'd be the other way around. I thought at some point I'd end up behind the desk hiring bass players, but I haven't really hired many over the years. Yeah, maybe it was just that, um, that, that generation, you know, 10, 20 years before in the 70s and 80s when the 
the LA scene was happening, the London scene was really happening, maybe that would have been more where you'd ended up. But yeah, maybe if it was if it was still the eighties or the seventies, maybe yeah. there would have been more stuff coming my way. But yeah. Um, so then, from Galliano was uh, that was till ninety seven, you said. Yeah, it was, well, it was just the one year that I was involved, oh, okay. really, from doing the world tour, and then we did a few festivals, and then and then the band was over. Yeah. Um, so then, did the did the phone start ringing? Your name get passed around more, or uh, name got passed around more. Um, I th it just casting my mind back, uh, there were a few solo projects which stemmed from that band. Okay. Uh, and the people all of a sudden had time for. So, uh, the keyboard player from that incarnation of the band, Ski Oakenfall, who also uh, writes a lot with Bluey, Steve, even to now. Um, he went solo for the first time, was signed to, to, to Sony France, and uh, we went as a trio, um, drums, keys, and bass, but I was also playing SH-101 synth, which I, I also did that in Galliano. Um, oh, okay. right. yeah. And I think the only reason I was able to do the bass synth is because I'd grown up with the keyboard around. I, I didn't have any lessons on, on keyboards. Sure. But I could handle the bass part, no problem. You know, oh, yeah. just a little bit of rehearsal is like. Well, cool. Nowadays, that's you know, that's like almost prerequisite for a lot of bass players. Is can you do mono synth as well? Yeah, so you're you're a pioneering man. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, obviously, but um, <laughs> funny. Enough, I was thinking about this the other day. That I'm not really asked to do it a lot. Sometimes it comes up. Can you play a bit of bass synth? Yep. Maybe we'll get you a synth. We talked about it on this tour too. Yeah, right. And then we end up doing it on bass guitar. It always sounds in this band certainly, but mostly, organic. yeah. Like I, I've. Very rarely even brought a pedal out on the road. I think I've got an yeah. octave there. So I've only just bought it. So I just thought I'd maybe uh, I'd do a little bit of recording with it. But um, yeah. yeah. What, what, what is your gear set up at the minute? Um, well, because we fly pretty much everywhere, we're hiring in rigs. Um, and uh, the rig which I've been choosing since I joined the band, in fact, way before that, in fact, maybe for 20 years, when I've had a choice of rig, I say, can you get me Ampeg? And you usually can get unpegged no matter where you are. Yeah, there's a few reasons, and one of them is because it's available. Um, they don't always turn up in perfect condition, but you kind of hope that they do. Um, uh, but when they do, it's a, obviously there's a lot of power from the classic head, which is the first choice. I usually have an a 8x10 cabinet. Yeah. Um, obviously, we're a big band, so I need volume and clarity. Mm -hmm. So there's so much power, clean power in that rig. Um, that I can go in with a brand new one on a non-problematic stage sound-wise, I can be pretty much flat. Uh, sometimes I take the bass control and add a little bit if, if the bottom end is being dispersed a lot. Um, I'll just balance it up with that. I rarely touch anything else. Um, with, uh, over the years I've tried a few other different amps or when the Ampeg rig hasn't turned up, uh, different other rigs have turned up and I've got to try them. And I've been surprised really um, I think that maybe because I'm coming from always playing jazz basses, and in my mind, I'm always kind of going for that slightly old school sound. Bit of Marcus Miller or more old school than that? Not particularly, no, because um, it, I, I don't really play that way. I mean, um, sure. the brightness that you get from a lot of slap playing, I, I, it kind of unnerves me a little bit. You know, I'm not, I'm not the most <laughs> you, you confident. Don't, you don't always want to cut, you don't, you're not a cut through kind of guy. You're more. Well, I, I don't want to cut through. Yeah. I'm still trying to be supportive. I'm not saying that Marcus doesn't do that. Marcus has got it all covered, trust me. Yeah. But, but the way I've always heard bass, it's, never, it's always been a band thing. I've never listened to the bass player on its own. Yeah. It, just, it, 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 it bores me to just check out the bass player. If I was going to gravitate to anything, it'd be the drums. Right. When I was a kid, that's what it was. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd listen to the drum part and I'd be air drumming yeah. the drums. I'd never be like <laughs> playing the bass part to myself. It's way not, we are, uh, air bass is nowhere near as cool as air drums. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think so, yeah. Well, actually, is any of it cool? I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I saw, hey, I saw a guy yesterday going crazy air bass when what his head came on. He was just like, <laughs> I was like, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so Ampeg stuff and then pedal board or no pedal board, you said? Uh, well, I was, I was going to add actually oh, that since, since just yeah, recently, um, there's been a few gigs that we've did, done where the Aguilar uh, DB751 head has been there. Yeah. And each time I've been just surprised really that it's, it's put me in the ballpark of my sound without really messing around. Mm. And I look at the control and it's down to like eight o'clock, the volume. I'm like, how is it? I'm scared to go anywhere above it. Is, <laughs> wow. is, is it this powerful, this low? Yeah. You know, in what situation do I need to go up to like midnight or something? It's incredible. Um, it's incredible. So, yeah, yeah. and it's been with a variety of cabs, but mostly with uh, either two four by tens or an eight by ten cabinet. And it's just stuck in their heads, like front of the house. The bass sound sounds great here. You know, yeah. I'm like cool. You like it? You know, 
Uh, the, the most recent time it happened, we did a festival with Chic. It was actually the Fold Festival, which is run by Nile Rogers, and there's a, a, a London version of it. And uh, the Ampeg rig, which they got for me, went down. So uh, Jerry said I could use Jerry Barnes, the bass player from Chic. He said I could use his rig. And at that point, I was like, this is just mad. I'm, this is right. It's, it's uh, now I can completely compare them next to each other. Yeah. And this is like a great modern sound that I think really, really works. And everybody was really happy again. So just recently, um, we've changed the, the spec on our rider. It's not kicked in yet. Ampeg has turned up for everything in Australia so far. But when we get to Japan, I'll get uh, I'll get a uh, Aguilar Very rig well. then. Um, I'll have a slightly smaller rig, which I'll, I'll get to try at the Tone Hammer when we go to Hawaii yeah. um, with two two by ten cabinets. I'm really interested to try that because obviously okay. it's a smaller rig. Yeah. Uh, the thing the thing with the Ampeg Classic and the and the the uh, 751, so obviously they're very ha heavy. And you know, I'm old now. I don't want to carry something which is really heavy. So if you've got a small portable rig with a great sound, then I'm really, really interested. So yeah. that'd be great to see if it works in this band as well on a smaller yeah. stage. There are lots of other really great rigs out there, um, and uh, but they all have different approaches. And I think this is the thing: you've got to find the thing which speaks to you. Yep. Um, I mean, maybe we're in a better situation now. There's more gear available now than there was, say, 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I just right. remember a lot. A lot uh, Normally, when I couldn't get Ampeg, say 15 years ago, an SWR rig would turn up, you know. And I used to struggle with these things. I'm like, I can't. I don't feel. Like, I feel like I'm playing through my hi-fi, but it just. I don't feel like. Yeah. I feel like I'm playing the wrong bass, or my fingers are wrong. Something's not right here. But I'm yeah. not quite kind of, kind of instantly getting that tone that I really relate to me. I don't really feel comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, no. Recently, I've tried some other really good stuff, and people keep mentioning things to me, but I don't have a lot of time. Check them out. To test everything. Yeah, and you, and like you say, you really have to A B stuff back to back to really know. I think with gear, especially, sometimes you know straight away, but it, you can be deceived by. The it, room you can be deceived whatever, by the room. Um, I mean, I'm I'm fairly confident for the for the large part because I know my bases, um, right. so uh, I know what they sound like. I know what I'm wanting to hear from them. Yeah. And then there's a preference things like you know, and that doesn't all sound the same through any set of cabinets, you know, so you have to be aware that if you're playing through very small speakers or, you know, or 15s, it's not going to give you the same response as 10. So don't think that that's the sound of the amp. There's a whole kind of system that you yeah, have to take into so consideration. Stuff. Yeah, but it does help if you get to play a gig, you know, a whole gig using some gear. And yeah, as yeah. I said, the Aguila stuff has just been really impressive. Yeah. Given that I'm not this old school player, it's, it's hard to impress really by yeah. a, a lot of stuff that's out there. So what, what bases are you playing? Okay, so I play uh, Atelier Z basses. Cool. Uh, now that's not like, um, that's out of choice. They've been really good to, to me as a company from the day that we met them. Um, I've been playing Fenders for years up to that point. I think I had four or five Fenders at one point that were all getting used to different degrees. Um, but we just wanted to try a few different things out because we had an album coming out. I think this is like six or seven, maybe even longer years ago. Uh, so Bluey got in touch with them just before a Japanese tour, and um, Johnny Motohashi from the company, he came down to the first no, uh, gig that we had at Bluno in Tokyo, and he, he had a guitar for us to use on that tour, a guitar and a bass. Um, at, my, my Fender stayed in the case from that moment onwards. I was like, this is really nice, I'm going to continue playing it. And as more and more gigs came through, I thought it's really... I feel like... <laughs> I always felt like I was slightly... Me playing my, my, my 78 Fender that I, I was using at that point with the band, I felt like I was a little bit kind of holding on to the past. Yeah. I, I, it, was, it was giving me what I wanted, but I felt a little bit like, I don't want to, turn in, I don't want to fossilize here, but I am playing like a 78 um, Fender Jazz and whatever classic rig turns up. And it's, um, it's very old school. <laughs> Maybe you should be less old school, you know. So when this bass turned up and it was giving me the tones that I wanted, it felt like it had more punch and power. Mm. I was like, this is great. And I, I kind of never looked back from that one bass. Yeah. And it was, it was the only uh, uh, Atelier Z that I had for a year or two. And the next one, I, I actually forget now because I've gone through a few of them. Um, five string always? I've got one five string, although I, had, I did have another one that they, they, they gave me for a long loan. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, as much as I loved it, um, I kind of didn't need another one. Like sure. the, the one that I, the, the one that I play with, yeah. I kind of get everything that I want from it. Uh, I've also got the preamp, an Aguilar preamp. Uh, uh, sorry, no, I'm getting mixed up here. It's not Aguilar, is it? The actual Atelier Z preamp that was in the one that they lent me, I bought that in a box on its own. Okay. So, it's, so I, and I get the same sound on my 
the one that I've got, so that I was getting on their one. It's a slightly different tone because that one had a maple neck and mine is rosewood. But I'm, I pretty much always know which bass I'm going to pick up to get a certain result. Yeah. Uh, they do a limited edition P bass, uh, which and I, I started on P bass. Yeah. Um, so it was really lovely to, to kind of have that sound again on a really well made instrument. Yeah. Um, I now have a fretless, which is the same as the first right. um, limited edition bass that I had, the fretless version of that. Cause I, I, the, the bass that I started on was a, it was a cheap £10 cof, copy that I bought from um, yeah. uh, this guy who was on my course in Manchester, Precision Copy. And then somebody who, I'd love to track him down, but I've forgotten his name, um, but somebody who was at my college took the frets out for me. <laughs> Just that's thought, a oh yeah, thing. yeah. Like, I thought, oh, all right then. You know, I knew I wasn't going to have this bass forever. At some point, I got great, but I had this like completely knackered bass. But <laughs> actually, it was kind of cool because it it meant that my intonation, I had something to aim for rather than this being sloppy and just reaching for anywhere yeah, in the gets fret. Definitely technique in order. Yeah. So this is the first fretless that I've personally owned. I've had others, but they weren't like technically mine. The first fretless that I've owned in in twenty years. Right. Um, and it, it's gorgeous. I'm like. <laughs> I really have all that I want. I have a six string from them, and my I, I don't have any high kind of desires with a six string, but I find that people are quite snobbish about it. So if I even mention it, if I take a photo with it, people are like, oh, you know, uh, what are you doing? And I, I just I couldn't care less what people say. Yeah. Once again, I come from records. I don't come from. I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking the sound. I'm, I'm I'm less inclined to think about gear. To yeah. be perfectly honest sure. with you, I like good gear. I like gear that works and does what I want it well, to it's do. A, it's but, a tool, and it has to. It has to. You know, it's meant to be the, in my head, it should be the easiest conduit from what's inside to getting out of there. Exactly, that's, that's all it is. It's, so, But it's, you know, the, the search and the journey is, is, is fun. It can be, but I'm, I don't think I've ever had enough loose money around to be like, I'm going to buy an <laughs> instrument. You know, yeah. I know lots of people do that, especially on the road, people like come home with like a couple of guitars, you know, they ship them home and what have you. But yeah, yeah. I, I, but yeah, that's not kind of what I do for my spare time. Really. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So how, how did the incognito thing come around? After? Uh, well, it's funny how things work out because, as I said, the first big thing that I did was Galliano. And yep. it was the first time I came to Asia, came to Australia. This is 1996. And, uh, 20 years ago, by the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And obviously 10 years ago as well. I yeah. hope it's not another 10 years. <laughs> um, and on that tour, we went to Tokyo and uh, we recorded a live album there. And uh, that night, we knew that uh, Incognito were in town. They were signed to the same label, so we had a heads up they were going to be there. And also Aswad were in town too. Um, we came off stage from just record, having recorded, and the dressing room was full. It was full of Aswad's people, full of Incognito's people. And I think in Incognito's band, I knew Richard Bailey, perhaps I'd done one or two gigs with him in town. I don't think I knew anybody else who was in the band. But at some point in this very, very busy room where everybody else knew each other, Louis just came up and was just really, really chatty and friendly. And obviously he came up and I was like, I know who you are. You know? <laughs> um, and I said, well, what a lo lovely guy. Um, and I bumped into him in a canteen somewhere a couple of years later when he was rehearsing with Incognito. We, we just stayed in contact. Yeah. Like, but just, you know, not like heavily. We weren't just like calling each other, stuff like that. But one day he called me and said, I need um, a bass player to come to Japan with me to, do, to work with a few artists. So we went out there and um, just for like a couple of nights, I think we did like a gig at the Blue Note. And uh, once again, I thought, well, you know, he books a lot of people for incognito. It's almost like a finishing school. Musicians come through and what have you. You never know. One day, maybe the phone will ring, and eventually it did ring. I'm, I left my phone at home that day, and, my, and I came. Of I came back, and yeah, it's always that way. My partner says to me, "Oh, Blue's been trying to ring you." As you could see from the caller ID. So I called him up and said, "Hey, we're going to Indonesia. So, do you want to come with us?" You know, I'm like, "Yeah, sure." Cool. So we went out to Indonesia, and. and uh, and when this the, is with Incognito now? With Incognito, yeah. yeah. So it's the first time with them. And um, when the tour ended, Blue said, well, do you want to join the band? Wow. So I, of course, you know. And it came just at the right time for me. So I just had a new baby. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't really sure what I was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd, the last band that I did long term before that was the Afro Sound System. And they were just starting to kind of wind down for a while. Yeah. And um, I couldn't really rely on them as a main source of income. There wasn't anything really like that. So obviously with the baby on the way, I was like thinking, oh, I really need to uh, <laughs> get that nailed. Bang out of the blue. And then when he was about seven months old, that's when that call came. Nice. And, you know, I knew it would be good, but, you know, most of the things which are really good about that band, I've never considered. Like, even though the first gig was in Indonesia, a place I've never been to before, it didn't occur to me that, hey, they play in Indonesia. They, they also play, you know. Yeah, they get a massive reach. 
Yeah, we've been to, I don't know how many countries. I mean, I've more than doubled the countries that I've been to. And I've, I've done all right before that, by just being an incognito and traveling around. Yeah. And I also think that over the years, I've been very lucky with some of the artists that I've worked with. They have been very, very positive people trying to push something beyond just the songs, you know? Yeah. I seem to, yeah, just be lucky there. Africa Sound System were like that as well. It's very, you know, a mixed band being kind of like this utopia of multiculturalism and acceptance and, and cool. getting on yeah. musically and as personalities. And Bluey's achieved the same thing. He's got a band full of people from all over the place, yeah. you know, and he will always announce that this person's from here. I mean, I grew up in the UK, so when he says I'm from Jamaica, he's kind of, it's not just him making it up. He's referring to the fact that, yeah, you know, my, parents are Jamaican and they didn't have it easy when they came to Jamaica it's it's something that we can overcome he's you know yeah, we yeah. all live in the same place and we, we make music we yeah. we're in con concert together in many ways and we get on and yeah. um, well, I mean your drummer bears from Scotland <coughs> yeah he's over comes I know there's a joke in there <laughs> <laughs> we had like a couple of Scots people in the band and the English one and they will say like hey you know where else do you get to see like a couple of Scots guys and an English guy in the middle you know I know you get that um, so so uh, do you have a lot of time um, to do your own stuff when you're when you're not it's, running? It's you? hard. Okay, yeah. so for start, because um, this is a long tour, very long tour for us, six weeks away from home. Um, yeah. Very unusual for us. Oh, that's quite a lot. It's quite a long stint for you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I spent about a week packing, and in a, and I was <laughs> and thinking on, and, and repacking. In the packing. end, I, I, I know it's awful, but well, normally I don't mind it, but I was conscious that I wanted to bring what I needed to do some work in this period. Sure. And, I had to, in the end, bring mini keys. I wanted to bring both mini keys and a regular keyboard. Only two octaves can fit in the case. So I've come with mini keys. I find it really hard. It's not like, I'm not a pianist, but I've grown up with a piano all my life. Yeah. And I just need to feel that. And then I feel like I'm in that world that I've been in since I was a little kid. With mini keys, it's difficult. Um, <laughs> so it's basically with bass player hands, you know, where you Yeah, to... <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know, I, you know, before I started playing bass, in fact, I actually owned a guitar. I bought a guitar when I was 18. Right. I took that to Manchester with me. And I, 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 I try and learn these shapes, and my hands go like this. I just couldn't do it. Same, I, same with me. I tried I, guitars when I was just, it feels so just fiddly. Yeah, well, I didn't really have the staying stay power on it, but yep. it, was, it, it was noted by people around me is that oh, I was just playing bass lines on it. So when I got the bass, I actually was like, oh, yeah, no, that, I, I can play that song and that song. Yeah. But yeah, the mini keys, I find that difficult. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I'm working towards a solo project yeah. of mine, which will be bass led, which is something which I never really thought about, but it's. Louis and I have been talking about for a year or so. Um, Instrumental, vocal, bit of both? A bit of both. You singing? Hell no, I'm not allowed to sing in this band. I'm not allowed <laughs> anywhere near a microphone. So, um, and there's good reason for that. I mean, um, I probably uh, get together with Louis. I mean, he's such a great lyricist and songwriter. I've been there when he's written top, line, top lines, even to, I remember on the Citrus Sun album, we didn't really have a melody for one of the sections on one of the tracks that I came up with, the, the title track, People of Tomorrow. But we were recording like a guitar solo over it, and Blue was kind of singing <laughs> during the solo. I was thinking, why is he? He's kind of going to start putting Jim Mullen <laughs> off. He was doing the guitar. Right? Oh, Jim Mullen. And um, but actually, no. He was just coming up with a vocal line, which became the line of the song. And I was like, you just do it bang like that. You know exactly what it's going to be. Yeah. It just comes from you like in a second. And I'm not like that when it comes to vocals. So you, you know, other ideas maybe they come out pretty quickly. Mm. But um, but yeah, no. That if there's any vocals, even if I come up with them, it, I won't be singing them. Um, and I'm happy to work with Bluey there. I think we'll sure. have some nice collaborations. We've done it before, so. Um, but going back to what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, when I'm listening to, you know, other bass players, mm. uh, you know, it bass, solo bass albums kind of leave me cold a lot of the time. And it's not because they're not good. It's just that I, grew, I grew up with, with pop music and funk music that's just very like, you know, a band doing something and saying something, or even being quite artistic and subverting what you're expecting to hear. Mm. So that's what I get off on: is the whole of the music sounding yeah. a certain way. I think it's, I think it's hard to put the bass at the front of the band and make it make it work all it the time. It's difficult, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, some some guys can do it and have done it, but it's it's really hard to do. I think. Yeah, I mean, t don't get me wrong; I'm not knocking it, but it's a real big challenge, yeah. and I'm not sure that I, I want to take on. Given that I think it's difficult and, I, and my judgment for myself is quite high, yeah. that's quite a lot of pressure to kind of do it that way. And I'd rather like get to a second album and think, okay, well, I've done the first one. How could I now get something which is mm. more bass led and keep it in the context of what I've already done? So this is kind of coming out of nowhere, mm. you know. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I kind of want to write some, some good music. And I'll make sure there are decent bass lines in there, it's not a problem. But I, 
I, I want something which is, it just sounds good. I'd really like somebody walking into a room hearing um, a record thinking, this is great, who is this? Without thinking what bass player is this or thinking sure. this is a bass player's album, you know, th yeah, expecting yeah. it to be a band or something. That would be my goal if that's kind of the, the end feeling. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the ideas are coming together now. Cool. Uh, I, I, and we just have to work on budgets for sessions and things like that. They'll, you know, my yeah. background also is in programming. I work on Logic. So do you do kind of demo things up to a pretty high standard and then send it out to the guys? Yeah, the um, sometimes with, with Incognito and with, with, with Citrus Sun, sometimes we're short of time. So parts that I, uh, to record. Uh, um, mm. So sometimes a part which I put down, even though I did it to, to illustrate how I want it to be performed, we haven't got time to replace it yeah, uh, right. with real drums. So a few things have stayed. Uh, and then I'm, I'm sometimes in two minds about that. That part was never meant to be there yeah, or yeah. It's not, you know, if I knew it was going to be the final thing, I would have spent another week getting it just right. Um, but then it's, it's also a lovely thing when musicians are called in and your part is, they've just completely taken it to the next level. They've done something which really, really stands out. I mean, I remember doing a track called Night 75 and I programmed the drums. Um, I mean, I programmed drums since even before I started playing bass a long, long time. And I knew at the beginning I wanted it to have a slight, a slight Dave Garibaldi feel at the beginning. I just wanted it to start that way. I thought it's 1975. <laughs> Actually, I didn't think, think that. I just wanted it to have this feel because everything else in it had these references yep. in it. And uh, so that's what I probably at the beginning and Pete Ray Biggin was the drummer on that track. And me and Blueberry sat in the control room and he just did something at the beginning that was kind of not the concept that I had. So I just explained it to Pete and the first thing he played is what's on the record. Me and Blueberry literally were like, what? <laughs> that's why you call musicians. Yeah, you know? That's yeah. why you call musicians at that level as well. Yeah. Because you know, I've seen the cover versions. I've seen other people try, you know, drummers and stuff playing that intro online and stuff. <laughs> and it's it, he just spat that out. Yeah, it's literally, just came out of nowhere. It's just you know, one of the things that he did. But it's the magic that you get in the studio. Same yeah. when we have like Matt Cooper replacing my keyboard parts. You know, my keyboard parts are, are, are edited. It's very rare that I actually. That's, well, God. Just like a couple of times I play Fender Rose. Obviously, that's not edited. But when I I'm doing it with uh, yep. samples, what have you. Even before I give it to Bluey, I tighten it up yep. and make sure it fits the feel. But we've got Matt Cooper in the band. Why do we want to do that? You know, a few pad things we keep um, that are mine. Just but other than that, Matt something. will just put Play. the most beautiful piano down. I yeah. can't, you know, I can't do that. Yeah. I don't want to do that. You know, I want to call Matt Cooper and have him do For it. Sure, so, yeah. 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 Cool, man. Yeah. Well, I reckon that's that's a lot of stuff. A lot of good stuff. Cool, cool. It's really interesting. Um, Francis, thanks for taking your time out. To, yeah, well, once again, thank you for, for asking me to be involved. No worries. Guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, and we'll see you next time.